Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you this morning. Welcome uh, to church. Welcome to St. Peter's Baptist Church. If you're uh, here for the first time, and I notice that a few of you are, it is great to have you with us. And if you're joining online, uh, you're equally as welcome, even though you can't be in the building. It's great that you can connect and we can worship together. We can worship the God who we love, who we rejoice, who we know uh, together. Let us settle our hearts and our minds, and let us come before him. Whatever is on your heart, whatever is going on in your life, you can bring that before him this morning. You can bring that into your worship. You can bring that uh, into your life. And as we study the theme of freedom more, as we continue our preaching series on the book of Galatians, and Tim Goodall brings a sermon a little later on Galatians 2, uh, let's know what he has done for us, the freedom that we have. And let's rejoice and praise his name for what he has done. Let's pray. Father God, we, we love to come together and we love to come before you. And we come to worship you now. Lord, will you receive our praise? Will you receive our worship that it might be pleasing to you? And will you move in this place? Holy Spirit, have your way here today. May we be changed. May we be transformed. May we become more like you, Jesus, as we gather and worship you in spirit and in truth. In your name. Amen. So, shall we stand? And we're going to worship. Matt and the band are going to lead us. And let's praise him together. We've got a new song to start this morning. Ooh, indeed. So, we were thinking about the, this new season of freedom and... Um, I did a bit of praying and, and we talked together as different worship team leaders and we thought we want to not just invoke freedom as, as a concept but the joy that comes with freedom. Um, and so we've got this song. Um, it's quite simple. I hope you can catch on. Um, but we'll be doing it a couple of times over the next season. So let's, let's worship together. free to have a bit of a boogie if you like. Love it, let's do it. Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Like the weight has been lifted, traces waiting. When the Spirit of the Lord is there, is freedom. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Come out of the dark.
chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Come on, sing that again, chains. Chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Lives made whole, hearts awake. Heart 
Father, so we pray that you will inspire us to live lives that are rooted so deeply in you that even when the darkness comes, we can say, blessed is your name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to kill the worship vibe a little bit here, okay? We've got a car in the car park that has its lights left on. So if your car's registration number is V407, I'm going to say MYC, you might want to go and turn your lights off, okay? There we go. No one's running out, so don't know what that means. Oh, Di's going, well done, Di. Okay. Good morning. Uh, welcome if you weren't here at the beginning. It's great to have you worshipping with us this morning. Um, I am Rebecca, and you should know about me that when the weather is cold, I have no voice. So this is what's happening this morning. Rebecca has no voice. Um, everything in the CYF world is as normal this week, so we're back to Eden Story and Bumps and Babies on Tuesday. We had another 10 new mums last week, which is amazing, absolutely brilliant. God's doing some really cool stuff in that group on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, and if you'd like to know more about that, speak to some of the team, because it's really ace. Um, I want to share something with you this morning. I don't normally do this, but I came across a brand new resource um, this week. It has only been released on Friday. It's been created by an organization called Parenting for Faith, who are absolutely wonderful and are part of the Bible Reading Fellowship, if you've heard of them. But their new book that has come out on Friday, which hopefully we've got a picture of in a second, is called Grand... Oh, there it is. It's just not on that screen. Um, it's called Grand Parenting for Faith. And now I know we have got a whole load of grandparents in this room whose heart is to see their grandchildren following Jesus. But that can be really tricky because for some grandparents, you're really present in your grandparents' lives. You do the school pickup, you have them for sleepovers. For some of you, your grandparents live in other countries, okay? So it's not so easy. What if your children aren't Christians? What does grandparent of fit, grandparenting for faith look like if your children aren't on board with that? So what I've done is I've put a list, um, a sign-up sheet in the, um, just outside here. And if you would like a copy of this book, they will cost £10 maximum, but hopefully a little bit less than that. And I'll order a bulk amount of them so that we don't have to pay as much money. They are also doing an online Zoom course in the beginning of February, which is two hours long. I think it's £10 for that as well. And it just gives you a little bit more of an insight into the heart behind this book and really your place in the world as a grandparent and what ca that can look like for your grandchild's faith journey. I'm really excited about it. I think it sounds really great. Everything that Parenting for Faith does is absolutely brilliant. So I really recommend this to you. If, you're, if that's where you're at in your life right now and you'd love to know how to intentionally grandparent your grandchildren for faith then get yourself a copy of this book pop your, night, pop your name on the list at the back there's also a tick box if you'd like to know a little bit more about the online course as well and I can send you the link for that 
Um, I think that's it. Next Friday is our next Unite event, which is our youth-wide event for our young people. It's going to be at St. Paul's Church this time, and we're doing a meal, which will be exciting. Thankfully, I have nothing to do with the cooking, so everyone can be rest assured that there won't be food poisoning. Um, so that's going to be next Friday. If you, you should know about that if you're a parent or if you're a young person, but if not, come and grab me or Isaac, and we'll give you a little bit more information about that. So we're going to sing, we're going to do our family worship song together, so we're going to stand up, I'm going to get some of the children to come and help me with the actions, anyone going to come and help me today? Well done Charlotte, good girl, well done Zoe, come on, excellent, and after this song we'll head out to our groups. High. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land, that all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We wanna see, we wanna see, we wanna see Jesus lifting high. We wanna see, we wanna see, we wanna see Jesus step by step, step by step. We're moving forward, little by little, we're taking ground. Every prayer, a powerful weapon, strongholds come tumbling down and down. See the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land. That all men might see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see. Well done, everyone. Take a seat. The kids are going to go out to their groups. Have a good time. Ah, oh, great stuff. That is one of my favourites. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Okay, so but notices to bring to you this morning, what's going on in the life of the church. But the first thing I want to tell you is about the Christmas offering, which we split 50-50 between, uh, between Worcester Food Bank and the Tier Fund Middle East Crisis Appeal for the Gaza-Israel situation. Uh, and the great news is that the total, we closed it last week, uh, is £4,470.54. So I think that deserves a round of applause, really, doesn't it? I think that's fantastic. It's great to see the church's generosity in that, uh, wanting to support that uh, difficult situation out in the Middle East and also help those locally who have such need. Just a reminder that the bereavement journey has started uh, and is going really well and quite a number of people from both the church and the community have come along to that. It's been really great to see uh, and they've been really welcomed by uh, Shafali and by David and uh, it's great to see them gathering and pressing into those needs around those issues of loss. Uh, and so uh, really in encouraged to see that. And if you do want to join, you still can. Uh, so uh, do have a word with, uh, I'll point you in the right direction, or with David or Shafali after the service, uh, if you are interested in that. That's on Thursdays, uh, and uh, from 1.30 until 4 p.m. here in the building. We have a church members meeting uh, coming up on Wednesday evening, 7.30 here. Uh, it would be great if you're a member to come along to that as we uh, discern the mind of Christ, as we seek him for the year ahead, as we go through some uh, important issues in the life of the church uh, and seek his leading. 
Uh, it's really important that we really do turn up and, and press into that together, every member together. When The more that we have, I, I just get that sense, the more people that we have, the more discernment that we have because God speaks to each one of us and we will have a, an input to play. So uh, please do prioritize that and come on Wednesday if you can. And then just to let you know that the foundations course, the next one is next Monday, so not tomorrow, but a week tomorrow, 7.30 here if you are interested in baptism or membership. If either of those things is something that you're considering, that you'd like to, to move towards, if you're not yet baptized, but you feel God leading you in that way, or you've been here for a, a few weeks and you're feeling that uh, it's right time to become a member, uh, do have a chat with me. It would be great to talk to you uh, and get you onto that course and talk to you about all that that means. Uh, and we go through all of that in a couple of hours, uh, and that will be next Monday. So uh, do let me know. Uh, it would be great to have you along. Let's, uh, let's pray together. I'm going to ask Kim to come. He's going to lead us in our prayers this morning. Thank you, mate. Morning, church. And morning, church online this morning, wherever you are. Uh, we just... Uh, also welcome, hopefully, Jean-Jacques and Selina from China uh, this morning. So, uh, my name is Kim Stansfield. For those that don't know me, there might be a few of you who have no idea who I am. I'm just part of the uh, church uh, leadership team uh, here at St. Peter's. Um, and uh, I'm welcoming this morning uh, one of my street pastor friends, Nigel, who has joined us this morning, which is great to see. So, in the past week, a team of eight of us headed up to Derbyshire, where we had the privilege and absolute blessing of attending the Fresh Streams Leadership Conference. And a number, number of us stayed back in Worcester and tuned in for the online uh, uh, relay of the uh, meetings that went on. So I've incorporated some of the key lessons I brought away from the conference. And I will then finish with a modified closing prayer from today's Lectio 365 Daily Devotional. So maybe we just calm ourselves, bow our heads, and I'll pray. Dear Father and creator of this world we live in, we come to you today to praise you for your love, your grace and mercy towards us, and your good purposes for the whole of your creation. As the master craftsman of the craft of the kingdom of God, we ask you, Lord Jesus, to apprentice each and every one of us in this craft, that we may weave it into all of our homes, communities, workplaces, rest places, and relationships. Father, we ask that through your example and through the presence of your untamed Holy Spirit that you show us how to apprentice all that we meet to serve you with their heads, their hands, and their hearts. Th through this, may we all become more like you day by day and teach others to grow with us into your likeness. May we rewild our fellowship with your Holy Spirit as it seeks to release all of us from the chains of fear, self-loathing, addiction, and sin. May the fruits of your Spirit be born in the good soil of our culture, our words, our actions, and our service to others. May our culture be one that encourages and releases the practice of God-given gifts, where blame is banished and replaced with love, mutual support, that we are a church where people are commissioned, coached, and consecrated as weavers of the craft of the kingdom of God. We thank you for last night's street pastors team, for Phil, Mark, and Kirsty, 
and walked as Jesus would, serving all people in Worcester City Centre. We thank you for the Prayer Pastor support team, coordinated by Sue Gilgan, of the Prayer Pastors in our fellowship. Father, uh, this mission is just incredible. We pray for the homeless in Worcester and thank you for the work of the St. Paul's Hostel and Magstay Centre Charities, helping people get safe places to sleep, shelter and eat. Father, as we look to the week ahead, we pray particularly that your spirit will speak into the life of the church at our church members' meeting on Wednesday night. May all that attend be open to your guidance and loving in the way we share what we hear from God. May we have humility as we join together to, to discern God's will. We thank you for the spiritual growth happening in the Beta Group, following on from the Alpha Course, and for the Hope Explored evenings coming up. And pray that your spirit will ignite everybody attending. We look forward to joy, with joy, to the baptisms taking place next Sunday evening. We pray for the bereavement journey being run next week, Thursday evening, that grieving hearts will be healed and people built up for a future of joy and flourishing. And Father, we pray for the thousands of families that have been devastated by violence in Ukraine, Gaza and Israel, to name just a few war zones. We pray for those that have escaped and for those that remain, that they will find joy and hope in you rather than grief and despair that the world imposes on them. May Tim's message this morning from Galatians, a free through faith, take hold throughout the world. And finally, from Lectio 365, I finish with this closing prayer. May this day bring Sabbath rest to our hearts and our homes. May God's image in us be restored and our imagination in God be restoried. May the gravity of material things be lightened and the re relativity of time slow down. May I know grace to embrace my own infinite smallness in the arms of a God's infinite greatness. May God's word feed me, his spirit lead me into the week and into the life to come. Amen. Stay in this place of worship, stay in this place of prayer, speaking to God, listening to God. Let's sing oceans. Being led out by faith onto the waters. He called me out upon the water, the great unknown, where feet may fail. Find you in the mystery in oceans deep. My faith will stand, and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the when oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in tears. Surrounds me, you never.
fulfilled and you won't start I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me. Where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my soul oh, One more time Take me deeper where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet can ever wander my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill law and prophet To a virgin came a word From the throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
to the waters. We trust you. Lord, we, we pray for Tim now as he comes to bring your word. May you fill him with your Holy Spirit and may we all hear you through him now. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all. So we're continuing our uh, series on Galatians this morning. Last week we had our uh, opening gambit, as it were, from, uh, from Andy. But this week I want to start with something totally different, some good news. Many of you will know our missionaries, Jess and Raf, who work with YWAM. Jess is also my daughter. <laughs> and so... Yeah, I just wanted to announce uh, the birth of uh, Lucas Micah Hartman. Uh, £7.13, uh, mother and baby doing really well. If you want to know more about Jess and Raff, there is a, a leaflet on the table outside at the back, and the ministry that they do down in Sussex. Okay, so today we're looking at Galatians chapter 2. We had uh, the whole of chapter 1 last week. Just waiting for, there we go. So, this week it's freedom through faith. Freedom through faith. Let's start by reading God's word together. 
Then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this is Paul talking, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation, and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure that I was not running, and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we would continue to remember the poor, the very thing I'd been eager to do all along. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men arrived from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew and yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then? that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs. We who are Jews by birth are not sinful Gentiles, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. But because by the works of the law, uh, sorry, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if, in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Wow, strong stuff, heavy stuff. I have brought to mind the scripture from uh, Hebrews 4.12 that says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Next side, Slyrill, please. It was a deep and thorough study of Galatians that led Martin Luther to develop his 95 theses in 1517, and that sparked the Protestant Reformation. It was reading Luther's commentary on Galatians 200 or so years later that led to John and Charles Wesley's salvation and thus to the uh, Wesleyan revival of the 18th century. I wonder what a careful study of Galatians can do for St. Peter's Baptist Church in 2024. So Galatians was written in about uh, AD 48, 49 by Paul. When you read it, It needs to be read in an angry voice. I tried. (laughs) Because Paul was furious 
with what had gone on in the Galatian churches. He was upset that the gospel was being distorted by Judaizers, people insisting that parts of the Jewish law still need to be fulfilled. So last week, uh, Andy took us through that. Um, He also pointed out that chapters 1 and 2 are actually partly autobiographical. Um, Paul gives us a brief history of his his life. What he's doing is he's establishing his credentials as an apostle. And he also covered um, the um, controversy around circumcision. But as you can see, that also goes on into chapter 2, so there will be a little bit of overlap. So, to summarize, last week, freedom by grace. Grace is an act of God. This week, freedom by faith. That's our response to God's grace. So the key verses we'll be looking at a little bit later on, the meaty verses, verses 16 and 20 to 21. A person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. So because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. And skipping on to verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So what is our freedom in Christ? We explored last week uh, with Andy... um, To summarize, it's freedom from sin, freedom from the law. It can also be freedom from our past, freedom from habits and addictions. But more than that, it's a freedom to choose the way of Jesus. Freedom to have a deep relationship with the creator of the universe. Circumcision is just one part of the Jewish law. And although it was in itself a very real issue... In the Galatian churches, it represents, I think, so much more both then and now. We first come across the practice of circumcision, if you want to read way, 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 way back, in uh, Genesis chapter 17. Uh, If you're doing Bible in a year, you've probably read that already, unless you've fallen behind. (laughs) It's it's tough keeping up with the Old Testament. I'm trying it this year, and it's tough keeping up with the Old Testament, because there's such a lot of it to read. So, uh, circumcision was a sign of being part of the Jewish nation and religion. The law of Moses came much later, and that's dealt with with by Paul in much more detail in chapter 3. So we'll uh, come across that next week. So from from that point of view, it was part of God's plan. However, in the Christian context, it can be a danger to faith. If we succumb to circumcision, which Paul tells us is unnecessary, what else will we be drawn into, away from the freedom we have in Christ? Circumcisions have not gone away. In 2024, our circumcisions may not be literal, but they may appear in other forms. There may be other rules and regulations that we impose on ourselves and upon others. Some of these may be more imagined than real. Before you became a Christian and gave your life to following Jesus, what did you think being a Christian would be like? What did you think the rules were? What did you think might disqualify you from being a Christian? What would you have to give up? What would you have to do? Maybe no more going to the pub or football matches. No more glass of wine in the evening when you got home from work. Would you have to stop shaving your legs if you're a woman? Would you be compelled to wear uh, open-toed sandals with socks if you were a man? Would you have to eat quiche for the rest of your life? Would it be a minimum requirement to have a fish badge on the back of your car? You don't actually see so many of those these days. I think many of us Christians are perhaps not quite such good drivers as we would like to be. And... (laughs) 
don't want to be... Uh, hmm. Would you still be allowed to smile or not? Would you be giving up fun? Now, I do admit that's a very bad stereotype of how people saw Christians probably 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, it's not so true now. Um, more seriously, though, many church traditions do seem to impose additional rules. Roman Catholics, Protestants, Pentecostals, Orthodox churches. So we as Baptist churches, Protestant, are not immune. In the past, I've been part of a church where if you didn't speak in tongues, then you weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. And you were, in effect, a second-class Christian. That, I think, is imposing a circumcision upon believers. Back to the 16th century, it was the sale of indulgences or forgivenesses by the Roman Catholic Church. Yes, you could buy your forgiveness if you could afford it. That first enraged Martin Luther when he was studying Galatians. So what rules do we insist on? Do we still cling to some Old Testament laws and rules, for example, while inconsistently abandoning others? Have we added in extra qualifications in our understanding of what it means to be a Christian? There's a challenge for us, certainly perhaps for you to discuss over Sunday lunch. I'll leave that with you. <coughs> Maybe there are rules and restrictions you have picked up along the way. Excuse me. <coughs> Maybe there are rules and restrictions you've picked up along the way in your Christian journey, in the, your way of discipleship. Ask God to show you if there are any and pray to be released from them. But why does it matter? Why are we bothering this? Why does it matter? Well, I've already highlighted the key verses, um, verses 16 and uh, 20 and 21. We are accepted as belonging to Christ not by following certain rules or doing certain works. But we are justified, made right as far as God is concerned, just by faith. By believing and trusting in Jesus, in what he's done for us on the cross, what he is doing for us now. The book of Hebrews tells us he's actually interceding for each one of us, which is amazing. And he's working through us by his Holy Spirit. And we believe and trust, thirdly, in what he will do when he returns. Verse 20, just going to highlight this a bit. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. There is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And there's nothing we can do to make God love us less. We welcome and so thankfully accept God's grace towards us. Paul says, I do not set aside the grace of God. We cling on to that, don't we? If the law was still valid and still able to bring us to God, then why did Jesus die? In fact, the law of Moses is no longer valid in this way and cannot bring us to God. Paul explains that the purpose of the law is this, and we find this in Romans chapter 3. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight, or declared to be right with God, by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So what the Old Testament law does, the law followed by the Jewish people, is to show us what sin is. It highlights what bad behavior looks like. If there was no law against, for example, breaking into people's houses and stealing all their stuff, then we would not know that it was wrong. But the law is there. It was there, and it was followed, particularly by the religious leaders of Jesus' time. Jesus was not impressed with them, as I'm sure you know. So particularly the Pharisees, practice a sort of an outward religion. It was all show. In uh, Matthew's Gospel, we read that Jesus actually condemned 
their attitude, saying that they were like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but dead and unclean on the inside. They made a big show of following all the rules and regulations of the law, but inside, Jesus said, they were rotten to the core. If we need circumcision or other rites, rituals and rules, then either Jesus' death was a total waste of time, utterly unnecessary and a pointless sacrifice, because we can save ourselves, for example, by following the law or being circumcised, or it is at very least insufficient to save us. So we have to keep topping it up with good deeds or by following rules. If we start adding rules onto what it means to be a follower of Jesus, we are rejecting God's grace and forgiveness, which has been freely given to us because of Jesus. Here's a modern illustration. I found this in a um, commentary on Galatians. In 1999, in South Africa, health officials sent out millions of pamphlets about AIDS, because AIDS was and may still be a huge problem in Africa. Also distributed with each leaflet was a condom. The condoms were stapled, <laughs> yes, stapled to the leaflet, thereby puncturing them and rendering them completely useless. Circumcision and its modern equivalents are a bit like those staples, potentially completely negating the core of the gospel, Christ's death on the cross for you and me. No wonder Paul was so angry when he wrote. However, let me put your minds at rest. Romans 6, chapter 10. The death he died, Paul says, he died to sin once for all. Hebrews 7, verse 27. Unlike the other high priests, he, Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins, our sins, once for all when he offered himself. Hebrews 10, uh, verse 1. The law is only a shadow of the thing, good things that are coming, not of the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, part of the rules and regulations of being a Jew, make perfect those who draw near to worship. So what these three Bible verses are telling us is that Jesus' death on the cross is fully and absolutely sufficient for all of our sins for all time, for eternity. Enough for every sin you and I will ever commit. Whereas the law wasn't sufficient and never could be. Paul will say later, in fact, that circumcision seen as so important by those who are insisting on it as part of being a Christian, is really a non-issue. In verse 8, we read earlier, For God, who was at work in Peter, as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. In other words, Peter was preaching to the Jews, who, as it happened, were all circumcised. Paul was preaching to non-Jews, who, as it happened, were not circumcised. So at the risk of treading on Rob Giles' toes when he preaches on Galatians 5 in a few weeks' time, sorry, Rob, Paul says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. What matters is faith, It's who we believe in. It's where our freedom comes from. The death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection together make the most momentous, the supreme event in world history to date. And the event that has the greatest impact on our lives. The next one will be when he returns. The second half of that statement that I've just read, faith expressing itself through love, is, of course, what we do with that faith, express it through love. But again, I feel like I'm beginning to encroach on a future sermon, so I'm going to leave that there. So the application of all this is found in verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. 
Isn't that amazing? Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I think this verse actually sums up the first two chapters of Galatians, because in chapter 3, Paul starts berating the Galatians, and it's a sort of development. But up to this point, um, this verse is a summary. God's love and grace, that freedom by grace, expressed in Jesus' death and resurrection, and living by faith in Jesus Christ, who lives in us, Christ lives in me, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great news? If you're a Pentecostal congregation, I'd probably hear a bit more from you. Isn't, isn't that great news? Yeah. Fantastic. Christ lives in you and me. When we make that commitment of faith in Jesus, he lives in us by his Holy Spirit. We enjoy a close relationship with the one who was there at the beginning of time, in whom all things were created, it says in Colossians chapter 1. We have God's love in us to express to the world around us. We belong to a worldwide family of fellow Christians. We have the hope of being with Jesus forever. We are becoming more like Jesus every day as Christ lives in us. But each one of us is unique. We're not all going to turn into Jesus robots. As the author Nick Page puts it, somehow Christ lives in us and yet we are still us. Our us-ness, my me-ness, will not be eclipsed by Christ's presence. It will be enhanced, amplified, made alive. So we were, we were born to be truly like ourselves and truly like Christ. So each one of us is a Tim Jesus or an Andy Jesus or a Ruth Jesus and so on. The Victorian vicar and poet, Gerard Manley, Hop sorry, Gerard Manley Hopkins, put it like this. In his poem, As Kingfishers Catch Fire, he says, The man acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is. Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places. Lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his. To the Father, through the features of of men's faces. God the Father sees Jesus in each one of us. How much do you feel Christ lives in you? I'm sure there are days when you feel far away from God, or times when you say or do something that makes you think, oh, I hope Jesus didn't see that. <clears throat> we, we may put on a mask to other people so they don't really see us how they are, how we are. We're not very good at being vulnerable, are we? <clears throat> so we might have a Sunday mask. Or an everything's okay, thanks mask, when we're not okay. At the time of Jesus, actors wore masks to denote the character they were playing or the mood expressed by that character. They were called hypocrites, people who pretend. We translate the word, not surprisingly, as hypocrite. Jesus told us not to be hypocrites. When we do so, we are denying the freedom we have by faith in Jesus. In a minute, as the band returns to the stage, we're going to pray together. Firstly, we're going to ask God to show us if there's anything in our Christian journey that doesn't need to be there. Are we imposing any rules. It might be a misunderstanding of the gospel. It might be a rule that you insist on. Is there anything in our lives that detracts from our freedom in Christ, that punctures or threatens to invalidate the once-for-all sacrifice of Jesus? Then we'll pray for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can never do that too much, can we? can never do that too much. Clearing the rubbish out of the way, removing distractions and loudness and noises that crowd out God's voice. If the Holy Spirit flows out from us like water, then we need to be refilled constantly. 
John chapter 7 says, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the freedom we have through faith in Christ Jesus. Thank you that it really is that simple. No conditions, no extra laws. Just as the apostle says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. In other words, if we say Jesus is Lord and mean it, we are a Christian. We are saved. We are made right, made right with God, joining his family on earth, becoming part of the kingdom of God. Maybe there are some here who've never said that and would like to say that this morning for the first time, here and now. I don't want to embarrass anybody, so can we all say together, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Father, we have the freedom by faith in Jesus, to say this and we declare it to one another. If you've said that for the first time today, please make yourself known to either me or to Andy or to one of the church leaders. We'd love to have a chat with you. Father, show us where we are putting barriers in the way of your grace, where we are making things difficult for others to believe in you. Highlight to us the things which get in the way of our faith in you intentional or unintentional. Show us where our masks get in the way of the freedom of Christ that we have. Take away the outward show and help us to trust you in being vulnerable with you. Forgive us, Lord, and show us your ways. We acknowledge your grace freely given to us in Christ Jesus. We thank you that by faith we have freedom in Jesus. By faith, Jesus lives in us by the Holy Spirit. So now we ask to be filled again with your Holy Spirit. Fill us up, Lord. Flow through us like living water to those around us. Guide us and lead us to, to fulfill your will in our lives. Cut through the distractions, the noises that life brings. As the hymn says, breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy balm. Let sense be dumb, let flesh retire. Speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O still small voice of calm. You might find it helpful to hold out your hands in a gesture of submission and welcome to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us now. Fill us now. Dwell in us. Clear away the rubbish, the distractions. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue to worship together.
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory sings curses in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme. No power of hell, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever put me from his hands till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I The fresh streams uh, this last week, uh, and I was just praying to God in one of the sessions um, about this Sunday and and faith and um, and the freedom that we have through faith and the subject of today. Uh, and I felt God say to me uh, that He really wanted to release the gift of faith amongst us uh, in a in a new way. We know that faith is is both a a, a gift and a fruit. Uh, of the Spirit, and that uh, it is through the Holy Spirit that our faith can flourish and can be uh, powerful. We know faith aside of a mustard seed can move a mountain. God wants our faith to flourish so that 
we will have the freedom that he wants us to have and so that we might live for him and accomplish the things that he has for us to do. And God wants to release that gift in a fresh way, maybe a, a, a first-time way throughout uh, our church here. I believe that. Uh, and Tim has prayed for us this morning, an infilling of the Spirit that that might happen, that that freshness, that newness of faith, that purposeful faith might flourish here. Let's keep pressing into that in the days ahead, that that spiritual gift of faith might flourish into faithfulness as we live for him in freedom. Let us draw ourselves into that. Let us pray for that. Let us not just strive in our own strength to be faithful, but be filled to be faithful. Be filled and strengthened and released in freedom. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and nourish us afresh. Fill us afresh. Release that gift afresh in each one of us that together as a church family we might glorify your holy name. May our faith flourish in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us say our usual closing prayer together. Father God, as you lead us out onto our front lines, help us to love you, each other, and our communities, to release the gifts you've given us, and to invite others to meet with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Bless you all. If you'd like prayer this morning, please do come down to the front left, uh, where uh, there'll be a team available to pray with you. If they can come out now, that would be great. Uh, and uh, please do come forward for anything, for maybe uh, you want more faith to believe. Maybe you're believing for the first time. Do come down and be prayed for. Uh, otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing you uh, in the week and the next Sunday. And just a reminder, the next Sunday evening at Soul Food uh, is Terry and uh, Angie's baptism, which is a really special occasion. Uh, look forward to, to that moment. Bless you all. Have great weeks. Uh, and we'll see you soon.